we got to do first, of course, is take off the tires. And you guys all know, always mark the tires so we don't disrupt the balance between the wheel and the drum. I have the valve there, so I can go ahead and take my white out and mark that mud stud like that. I'm also going to mark the drum so I make sure to put it back in the right spot. Um, I might as well go ahead and put a L on here for left so that I don't forget um, which side I've got this tire and this drum on when I go ahead and do this because it's going to be down for a while. So I'm going to put L there. Um, everything's marked so I know where everything goes back. Um, I'm to off so I can pull the drum off. Breathe it. Dust. You don't want to. Don't blow it. You're going to go to the other side. Take off the key plate, gentlemen. To adjust the brakes, but I have a plug through the drum. It's kind of a pain. You have to take the wheel off to adjust the brakes. But we have a rubber plug in here. You have to go in from the front side to adjust these brakes. Okay. How do you that's spin all. it to check it? Say it again? How do you spin it to check it? You've got to spin the drum. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and raise the car. I'm going to pull the drive shaft out. I'm going to take the rear uh, cover off and drain all the gear oil out. So um, the half inch wrench, take the nuts off and the drive line. Okay, stop the drive shaft. And this is where you're going to want to take a couple notes on drive shaft. Drive shaft does two things. Besides the fact, of course, that it transfers the power from the engine back to the differential, it does two other things. As the car goes up and down the road, the differential is going to go up and down in bumps and over bumps and down and ditches. The drive shaft has to compensate for angular changes and for length changes because as the, the differential drops into a hole, the distance from the end of the tranny to the front of the differential gets longer. So the, the drive line has to be able to move. Say again? Angular changes and length changes. Angular changes because when it goes down, the angle now is the front is different. So the U joint provides an angular change. The U joint provides an angular change. You want to phase the drive shaft. You want to make sure the drive shaft is, um, or you want to make sure the center line of the pinion shaft and the center line of the main shaft coming out of the transmission are parallel. They're parallel. They're like this. You don't want one pointing down and one pointing like that. You want them parallel. Okay? So if this one's pointing down, you want this one pointing up. If this one's pointing up, you want this one pointing down. You want them parallel to each other. Otherwise, you'll set up a vibration inside the drive shaft and it's like no fun. It's got splines inside here, but they go in all about a couple of inches, so this is allowed to slide in and out as you go down the road. Okay? The U-joint allows you to make angle changes, and there's a U-joint on this side. When I was talking about these bearings, these caps sometimes will fall off. So you can wrap a piece of tape around there if you're concerned about that. I'm going to go set it right up on the bench. So I don't really have to... So that the cover one's going to pop off and all the oil go flying. Take a flat blade screwdriver and kind of gently pry down low, and the gear oil will start coming out. And uh, there it goes. Let's see how it looks. So move on the dark side. Okay. I've changed it. It hasn't been too long since I changed it. Go ahead and just hold that like that and let it drain out. Stop. Pinch bolt. You guys want to move around where you can see. Okay. There we go. You guys, you notice this bolt wasn't too tight. We're done thinking any trouble. Because when they snap, there's no way to get the differential part unless you drill it out somehow. So I pull this long bolt out. You have to rotate it down a little bit to where you can get it all out or up. Out here. Yeah, I can't. So I'm just going to let it sit there. This shaft right here is going to spin right out. But before it does, I want you guys to notice how much play there is in this differential between these gears, and there just goes my shaft right there. I have a whole bunch of play. You can hear it. Yeah. Okay, what I want you to do is uh, the gears in here and so on just slid all the way around. You can see them there. Here's one of them. 
Those are the spider gears. Good again, ring gear. These two are the differential side gears. Those two are the spider gears. The drive pinions inside, you'll see that in a moment. Now, what we got to do now is to pull these axles out. Watch what we do. You push the axle in, and there's a clip in here. Push the axle in, and you got to slide this clip out. John, uh, Jed, can you get a. Can you get a. Uh, oh, there it goes. There's the clip. On this side, you see if it's real worn. This one's not worn bad, okay? Here's our axle. Now, style of axle you'd like to have. Let me tell you why. <laughs> well, because the bearing rides right on the axle surface. That's right, before floating. Thanks, Larry, you're right. Um, <laughs> but what happens is when the bearing rides on the axle, it'll eventually wear that surface out, and then the axle's junk. You want a bearing that's pressed on, that has rollers, and so it has to capture with a race on the inside and outside. And the bearing wears out, you change the bearing. Fortunately, this is in really good shape. There's no, you have to see when they're bad, they're all pitted up and real bad. The other thing is on the other side where the clips go in, these things get hammered out real bad. This one's in really good shape. Here's to wear. One other thing you'll notice is, there's a shin. Now, this is really interesting, guys. Here's my problem. Okay, I want you to see this. This is important. This differential carrier has shims over on the side. The shim over on this side is it shouldn't be able to pull out like that. In fact, it looks like it's broken. It's like it's cracked. Anyway, that shouldn't be able to come out of there. What it gives you an indication is this thing has so much play this way. It's loose enough this command. Normally you're supposed to be able to tap, you're supposed to tap these in with a hammer before the cover's on there. And this thing's just moving out. And look inside. Um, can you grab me a light there again? There. You can see that both these caps have a rounded edge on one side. The rounded edges go to the outside. So I don't have to worry about turning them around because now I know the rounded edges go on the outside. But I have to worry about, I don't want to put this cap over on this side. I want to keep them on the same side. So I'm going to mark them. Thanks. So what you got to do is, there is a specific torque on these bolts that you might suspect. Yeah. Five days out. I want you to try and grab those washers. Okay. Yeah, this side, there's a big fat washer over there. There's one. Hey guys, this is important. When you pull the carrier out, this washer, you want to make sure it stays on that side. You know it's on the left side. I'll put the differential down. Third member down. Here's the washer that was just hammered. What had happened was it was able to slide over because there was so much play in there. There's supposed to be a little tension against it. There's so much play. It came over and then the axle, it was moved over like this. And the axle just start grinding into it. Okay. Now, hopefully, I'll have to replace this washer, but to, re to see how bad they are, to see if you can kind of determine where your noise was coming from. That's the right side. Here's the left side one. I had all kinds of noise and play inside this differential. Okay, this one has a big, deep kind of pit in it. You can see it, right? One right there. Okay. Um, but that's the bearing race. I have all new bearing races. Then you can go ahead and examine the bearing, which we're not going to reuse, by the way, this bolt to come out. I'll need to remember to put that bolt back into the third member before I put it in, right? Because I can't slide it in. So I got to remember that. Pull off and take a look. We're going to look at all these gears for wear. Look at our ring gear. Actually, my ring gear looks like it's in pretty good shape. I'll probably ask Larry's uh, opinion on inspecting my gears because you've looked at a lot of gears, probably more than I have. Now, here's the drive pinion in here. This drive pinion, this big helical gear, we're going to take out by taking the bolt off the back side. I'm going to clear some stuff out. The shaft in here is blind. I think we can tap it off with a hammer. Yeah. I was able to pull this um, flange off the front of the pinion with a puller like this, and then take a hammer and a piece of wood to drive the pinion out of the back of the differential housing down here on the floor. Okay. 
that's the carrier assembly. Um, once that was driven out, went ahead and cleaned all the parts up and inspected everything for wear. A couple of things you got to look for in terms of wear inside the differential. Um, you have the differential side gears, those two there, they're spline to the axle, and then the two differential spider gears that allow you to have one wheel spinning at a different speed than the other if need be around the corner. Um, inside, the shaft is what locates these two spider gears, so the shaft you have to look at for where the shaft is. This can be replaced, and these shims for these washers that the spider gears spin on will wear and in fact, this one right here, you may not be able to see it, but it's cracked there and there. That one needs to be replaced. I've got a replacement shim right here to replace that. Um, you can buy a spider gear kit at General Motors. It gives you these two gears, these two gears, this shaft, and the washers. My price now is about $150 for this transmission, for this differential. A couple other things you have to look at for wear. The two side shims that set the differential case backlash moving the ring gear closer or further away from the pinion gear these are the two shims you can select different thickness of shims to set that backlash there's also a shim that goes behind the pinion bearing that goes here on the on the drive pinion that sets the depth of the pinion down here that sets the depth of the pinion into the case or excuse me into the case this way or out of the case that way we call that the differential Pinion bearing preload. Okay? And the way you check that is by putting some uh, Prussian blue or some red letters, some kind of grease, and checking the gear pattern, gear tooth pattern on the pinion, between the pinion and the ring up here. If it's off, if you move, need to move the depth of the pinion, okay, that's um, pinion, I actually said that's pinion bearing preload, that's actually pinion depth. Okay? To change the pinion depth, you have to change the thickness of this washer right here. These two washers um, go behind the differential side gears, right like that. They just provide a wearing surface for that. These are fine if you were using. In this case, um, this differential was in pretty good shape. Um, my, this is my original housing on the floor. These gears in this differential case came out of uh, another differential out of the Camaro. I'm going to be using the Camaro differential for some reason. Main one being that my spider gears and differential side gears were worn out, and also the components for this Camaro differential are a lot heavier. The ring gear is a lot thicker, the differential case is a lot stronger, the pinion is larger, the bearing that this one uses is larger. Back here at the back um, uh, of the table, you can see there's the old bearings and races and seal and, and pinion nut that came off of this originally. Here's all the new stuff, um, and this stuff here came out of one of these Federal Mogul differential overhaul kits that I got from Westside Auto. It cost me, my cost was about $70, $75 on it. It gives you the two pinion bearings, okay, one here, one here. The two races, they have to be knocked out. The old ones be knocked out, the new ones knocked into the housing that's on the floor. Um, these are the two differential side bearings, okay, and they're two races. They gave me two seals, one will, they cover, the coverage is for a multiple um, cars, and so one of those will work for the front of the housing to seal the pins and gear all and spill out the front. To give you a, a new crush sleeve, okay, that sets the bearing preload. Okay, that's what sets the preload on these two tapered roller pinion bearings that fit on the shaft. This is some gear marking compound to check your tooth pattern, okay, for pinion depth. Um, then they give you a new, uh, we use the old washer, but they give you a new lock nut. Give you some sealant because you have to seal the splines and the threads here, otherwise, you'll get gear oil leaking out the threads and the splines um, where this yoke slides onto the front of the pinion. Yeah, you will get a leak there. Those bolts there for the differential cover that goes on the back. Now, a couple other things. Um, first of all, in order to get these old bearings off of the differential case, the two side bearings, one was on here and one was on the other side, the pinion bearing off here, the other pinion bearing up here of course just floats, that was easy to take off, this one had to be pressed off, I used this type of bearing puller here, put it in the big hydraulic press to press the big bearing off, then I was able to use the puller like this 
to actually lift the side bearings off. So go ahead and install them. I'll just use a driver like this. Put the bearing up there and hit it with a hammer, drive it down. So I need to assemble all the new bearings. I'll go ahead and put it together and then I'll have to measure first the pinion depth by checking the tooth contact pattern. And then after that, I'll have to check the backlash, okay, with the dial indicator on the tooth of the ring gear to see how much backlash or how much movement back and forth there is between the pinion and the ring gear here on the differential case. All right. Okay. All right. In order to set the pinion bearing preload, once the bearings are pressed on, the pinion's installed in the housing, which is on the ground there, you can take an inch pound torque wrench like this, and we'll see how much torque it takes to actually spin the pinion. And we'll do that by putting an adapter on here, going from three eighths, uh, going from three eighths up to a half, and put a socket on here to fit this pinion nut. Don't have to get the right size, but what we'll do is this pinion nut after it's installed, we'll put it on the shaft like that, take the inch-pound torque wrench, and see how much it takes to turn it. You want this pinion to start turning at about somewhere around 10 to 12. Um, excuse me, you want this pinion to start turning when it's meshed with the case, the differential gear, uh, ring gear, at about 10 to 12 inch pounds. If you assemble the whole thing with the axles and the housing down below, you want to see somewhere around 18 inch pounds. And that way you know you don't have too much preload on these bearings. In other words, the paper bearings are being slammed into the races. And that'll eventually wear them out if you have too much preload. So use an inch pound torque wrench to do that. Um, the only other things I'll have to do is down here on the axle housing on the floor. Um, the axles are out in the hot tank right now. But if you have these C clips that lock these uh, axles in, you want to look and see if there's any wear on the C clips or on the groove on the axle where these slip in. Um, you want to check both of those. We'll stop for this second. Okay, here's an axle I brought in. There's the groove that the clips fit in. You want to make sure that the groove is not beaten out and the clips aren't worn out so they fit nice and tight. The bearing that the right down here in the axle, on this type of rear end, it's a floating axle. The bearing is pressed into the end of the housing here and has to be pulled out. I'm going to put two new bearings in. There's also a seal out there because if you remember we talked about the place for a differential can leak are the two outside axle seals and the housing. Differential cover gasket right here. And the pinion seal that goes on the other side of the front, those are the places where it can leak. This type of axle depends upon the level of the gear oil to be high enough to go down through the tube and lubricate that bearing so it doesn't seize on the axle. But this is an inherently weak design to have the floating bearing out there and have it ride straight on the axle. It tends to wear the axle out and then you have to buy a new axle. Later style GMs and Ford cars have a bearing that presses onto the axle here. So what wears out is the bearing, you just press the old one off, push the new one on. Much 
with disc brakes as you do with drum brakes. Fading being that when you push down the brake, basically the car just keeps rolling. If the brakes get hot, they glaze over, and they does not want to stop the car. Okay, so with disc brakes, you can resist a lot of that brake fading, and the car will stop more quickly. Okay, if you guys look up here on the bench, John Monterey is going to get a picture of that. I've laid out all the stuff that you're going to need. Now, this disc brake conversion, this is, first of all, is will work not just on this car, this is 65 Chevy Nova station wagon. Any early Chevy Nova, let's say from 62 to 67, that came with drum brakes, this, this brake uh, conversion setup will work on, like I said, any of the Novas, early Novas, 62 to 67, any Chevelle like Jason's 69, all the way up through 72 on Chevelles. Novas, it'll work up all the way through 74, okay? Because of the type of design of spindle, that's what the limiting factors of years. When you go to a later models, you need a different spindle. So you can use this the same disc brake setup off the engine. This disc brake setup actually came factory equipped on a 69 to 74 Nova or 69 to 72 Chevelle, or actually any Buick Olds or Pontiac car with power front disc brake. If you buy all the stuff that you need in a junkyard, let's say you bought um, everything was just obviously used, calipers, the brake mounting plates, the caliper mounting plates, the dust shield, the rotors, the power brake booster. Let's say you got these are brake hoses here, and you got the old brake hoses off, um, say an old Nova or or a GTO or something like that. You bought got these brake hoses. Um, all this stuff in a proportioning valve. Now I'm using an adjustable one, but you got a factory one. Right now the going price in the junkyard is two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's just off an old car. Okay, that's nothing rebuilt, it's nothing new. The problems with that is the calipers after that kind of mileage usually at least need to be rebuilt because the seals inside them wear out. The rotors, okay, after a lot of miles, of course, they get thin and they get too thin. You guys all know they get too thin, they get beyond legal limits and you can't turn them any further. The master cylinders, here's the new master cylinder here, the master cylinder seal wears out, and of course, that'll eventually probably have to be rebuilt. Yeah, when are you going to take this into the bench brand new and try to prove it for me? Yeah. Anyway, that's a brand new one. Those things were out. Power, uh, power brake boosters on the diaphragm them eventually will crack and get holes and so on. So there's a lot of things that you can go on. If you spend $250 in the junkyard, you may not be getting such a hot deal. This stuff, um, of course, these are used and they don't wear. In this case, I have a brand new rotors. Um, there's one there on the bench. We've already already showed you how to turn that. I have a brand new master cylinder. I have brand new brake hoses. Rebuilt calipers with brand new brake pads. Um, and I have a brand new proportion valve I bought from Summit. It's an adjustable proportion valve because I want to limit the pressure to the rear brakes and I'll run straight pressure to the front. Okay. The reason, of course, we do that is so the rear brakes don't lock up. Now, a couple things. If you do a disc brake conversion like this, and because this works for so many cars, I think it's worthwhile to show you. You can't necessarily do this on a Ford, but any GM car, not just a Chevy, you have old Pontiac, you can go on. Here's the power brake booster. You'll notice that the bracket on here is angled. In the Nova, when you put this guy in and it's up there against the firewall, it sticks up like this, and the hood doesn't clear. All right? So when I first time I did this conversion for another guy, what he did is cut this off, ground the bracket down straight, welded it back on straight so it came out straight, then it would clear the hood. You notice how big the power brake booster is here. This power brake booster here is, off, is actually off this car or a car or a similar car. This one didn't come with power brakes, but it could have been ordered with power brakes. And power drum brakes, by the way, not power discs, power drum. So I got, this one's remanufactured, what they do when they remanufacture is they take it apart, they put a new rubber diaphragm back in it, put it back together, and that's it. It's like $125, it's expensive. Um, the one thing you'll notice about it is when this plate where the studs are here and it bolts up to the firewall, and these two studs where the master cylinder goes, is going to keep the master cylinder very level. You'll notice that the diameter of this is a little smaller, okay, so it'll clear the hood. The other thing about the diameter being smaller instead of going with this one, the Novas are light, they're like 2,900 pounds. 
You take this giant power brake booster, you're going to have a very, very sensitive, touchy brake pedal, almost too sensitive. My friend with his uh, 64 Super Sport that has the big power brake booster, I mean, you touch the brakes, you stop now, and your teeth just bounce off the windshield. Um, I, I don't want such a sensitive brake pedal. Um, my wife drives the car, wants the thing that's a little bit more user friendly, somebody to get in and take the dash when you break. So I went to the original one because it's a smaller diameter, it won't give you as much power assist. Now, I hope I'm correct in my assumption. Yeah, I could always change back, but I'd like to try and use this one. The other thing is, because it comes out straight, I don't have to do any modification to clear the hood. If you have from that one. One other thing you can notice is there's three studs here on this power brake booster. The original factory pedal assembly, and this is a pedal assembly that came out of one of these cars. This is a clutch or a stick type pedal assembly, so it's got a clutch pedal. Uh, I've got the pedal in the wrong spot. There's the clutch pedal there. There's the brake pedal. You can see your little brake warning light. This is for the emergency brake. The way this bolts in is these two studs here come through the firewall. And the original master cylinder clips right on and there's two nuts to hold it on. The power brake booster, you'll notice it has three studs. And what you have to do is you've got to drive these studs out, these two out, because these are going to come through the firing wall and the nuts are going to go on the back side. But you also notice from the factory, look what they do. There's the third hole right there. Um, I believe it's that it's good. To, we'll find out when I try it on that to press but. I believe that's um, the third stud supposed to come through there, and so that'll work. And usually on these cars, what you'll find is from the factory, in the firewall, they, they pre-drill the holes, or at least they dimple where the hole is supposed to be. So if the car came with power brakes or didn't come with power brakes, it's set up so you know where everything's supposed to go. And pretty much Ford, GM, Chrysler, even Japanese cars, they do that. So if a car comes loaded with all these options, it's set up to accept those options. So a lot of times it's, it's quite a bit easier than you think. The other thing that's a big hang up about this whole swap that makes it a um, pretty much, well, let me just say this, it, it's a bolt up situation with one exception. The spindles on a drum brake car are different than a disc brake car. Um, if you have Jason's Chevelle, what you can do with the Chevelle is that you can buy the, um, when you buy the $250 from the junkyard, you can get the spindles as well. That comes with this brake car, and it's a bolt up situation in your car. On my car, it's not because um, the ball joint on size on the lower ball joint is different than this one. You say, How did you know that? Well, I found out by reading an article where I originally found this conversion in National Nostalgia Nova. But if you call the junkyards, the junkyards will tell you they know what your ball joint, or you can look in the new parts book and you can see that the cars use, say, the same upper ball joint but different lower ball joints. And the stud size of the ball joint is actually larger on the Chevelle. So if you're going to use the Chevelle spindle on the Nova, you've got to change the ball joint. In order to do that, you have to machine the lower control arm, and you can do that. Or I can take this drum brake spindle and machine the spindle to accept the disc brake parts, and that's what I'm going to do. Go ahead and only take the uh, one side of the brakes apart at a time. In this case, I can go ahead and take both sides apart because I'm not going to use the brakes anymore. And also because I have enough experience that I know where the brake step goes. I use my um, wheel bearing dust cap tool to remove the dust cap off there. I'll pull the cotter pin out for the front wheel bearings. I'll take the nut off now for the front wheel bearings and take the hub off. Okay. One above my desk, okay? Okay, so I'll get the nut off. Don't get the stop. Your wheel bearing doesn't come off. These bearings, by the way, were brand new a couple years ago, so they're in good shape. I'll save these hubs and the grease seals. I repack these bearings, put new grease seals the night before I went to These brake shoes, they look real, real thick. They are because I replaced them just in August. Um, I'm going to quickly disassemble the brake here. I'll pop my things off so we don't launch and catch anything. Um, okay. Well, those guys don't need to see it. Huh? You guys remember that these are different lengths. They're not hard to keep straight. But they'll always be different colors. This one's blue in color. This one's green in color. You want to pay attention. You want to know where the springs go. And not pop this other spring off. 
self-adjusted bridge. Put it up here on your bench. Again, not worrying too much about location because hopefully this is done for on this car. Now we pull these whole bands out. One side and then on the other. Push in and twist. Slide the little anchor pins out. By the way, when you um when you buy a brake spring kit for a drum brake car, they will give you a new one of these. They're real hard to put on. You actually you remove the spindle because I'm going to machine the spindle. While he's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and put a pair of vice grips on the two front brake hoses because when I undo the brake hoses, I don't want all the brake fluid to come out of the master cylinder. You say, well, why? You can change master cylinder. Yes, but I don't want the mess on the ground right now and so on. I'd rather just keep this fluid in there for now. When I'm ready to change the cylinder, I can do that. So I'll go ahead and put one hose in there. Um, squeeze that hose. You don't want to squeeze so hard, hard to cut the hose. These hydraulic hoses are really expensive. They cost about $18, $20 a piece new. So make sure if you buy and you do a brake swap, and you get the old stuff on the car, you get the brake hose. A lot of people forget it. Unnecessary expense. Um, well, okay, well, looking at that, this big nut here that bolts the back in place to the spindle. I'm going to go ahead and bend this tab back, take that nut off. I'm also going to buzz these two up. You have to get the bleeder screw out before the wheel cylinder will pull out. Then I can unscrew it from the line. I've already loosened the brake line where it goes in the back of the wheel cylinder. So I'm going to have to do that before I you to do that. Um, upper and lower ball joints in here. Uh, Rob probably pull the cotter pins out. You loosen the bolts. You don't take them out all the way, right? Because we don't want the thing to fire down on us. But once it's loose, we're going to go ahead and hit it with the hammer, and then we can take the nut off. We're actually safe on this Nova because it uh, has an upper control arm, but the bottom arm is an I arm. It's just a straight arm. We don't call it an A arm because we come in an A type shape. The spring is mounted up above in here, okay? Because the spring is mounted up above, one of the things that's going to happen is when we unload and take the spindle off the ball joint, this arm can only move down about a quarter of an inch before it hits the frame, so the spring is captured. Plus, you'll notice there's a shield up in here that's bolted with six bolts, and that kind of captures the spring on the top. So it's easier in the sense that a long arm, short arm, conventional where the spring is pressing on the lower control arm, it's between the lower control arm and the frame. That, remember, you have to unload and you have to use a floor jack because the spring will come apart on you. This one's kind of safe. It just pushes the control arm down and we're done. Um, one thing you're going to notice, and I don't know if you guys can see it from where you are, but these, this perch, we call it a spring perch with the spring rests. It's got a bushing in there because it's got to be able to pivot slightly as the control arm goes up and down. Where the bolts are, there's some rust color. And what's happened is these bolts have broken my control arm right here. Look at the underside. It's all cracked. The metal's cracked up. When I take it apart, I'll show it to you. Probably what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to weld in some new pieces of steel to repair the arm. Seems to be kind of a weak point. I think I'm going to weld the other side up even with a piece of steel under there, even if it's not cracked. Wheel cylinder, and I'm getting great food out all over. One thing you got to notice is that there's a... Uh, Brass washer, there, a copper washer that I just dropped. That copper washer, all hydraulic lines need a copper seal that goes between the line and the wheel cylinder. Please be sure whenever you work on brakes, anything hydraulic, make sure you get sealed like that. It's like copper. Um, copper is soft, and so when you tighten down on it, it'll actually just smush right into it and make a good seal. You could use plastic. Um, it may be that you use copper, and I'm not positive on this point, but maybe. If it were plastic or something, that the brake fluid would heat it. I don't know that for sure. There. All I have to do now to get this backing plate off, and I want to get it off now before I take the spindle off so you guys can see what happens here. I've got to get this nut off, so i got to break back this washer and then take these two bolts. The size of the bolt that's used to bolt the, um, the upper bolt on the spindle for the Francis brakes. What this goes through, it goes through this is the main caliper mounting bolt. Here's the bracket that mounts the caliper. You see how big that hole is there? That needs that big 5 8 18 bolt. Can I check the length on Mr. Porter's car so I got the exact length? You guys, for those of you who don't know, you notice these lines on top of the head of the bolt? It tells you the grade of the bolt. 
six lines is a, what's what we call a grade eight volt. I know you say, why is it a grade six? Well, that's just the way they do it. It's a grade eight volt. Grade eight volt is pretty much the strongest thing you're going to find out there. There are stronger bolts, but of anything that you're going to find readily available, grade eight is going to be it. If you make grade five and grade three, um, and something that breaks, which is a pretty you know critical application, you want the strong bolt. Um, the only reason why it's gold colored is anodized. It looks nice. You'll notice that the size of this old one is, I believe that's half fine thread. This is 5 eighths, 18 thread. So one of the things we're going to have to do in addition to machining up on the spindle, we're going to have to <coughs> cap, or drill it out and cap it for 5 eighths, 18. This spindle, by the way, there's our steering arm. Hanging down, we want both of these in this pain. There's no problem with that. All we got to do with the spindle now is we've got to unload the ball joints and yank it off. Let me just show you what we're going to be machining. A big chunk right here at the bottom. Because with the disc brakes, you have to bolt the plate, the disc brake mounting plate up there. You've got to machine this back so that it'll sit in the right plane, actually perpendicular to the spindle. So that's why you're machining it. We machine it back 580 thousand, just a little over half an inch. You say, how did you find out the measurement? You can actually measure the thickness of the bracket and the dust shield and stuff that goes underneath here and come up with the number. Um, and that's what I did before. Okay, to break out the loops, you guys all know we can take a stick to hunga hammer and um, hit it right there on that. Hopefully, it'll break it loose. should never spin on the spindle. The bearing, inner bearing rate should stay still on the spindle. The outer bearing rate, which is in the hub, that should stay still. The rollers are what should move between the two races. Okay. Rob brought in a car recently that had races on both sides. Well, yeah, both sides of the hub. They were spun. You put your finger and grab the race and just move it. Okay. It should never move inside there. Neither should move on the spindle. Is there a press on race on the spindle? You know, the race, it's not pressed on the spindle, it is put on, and, and as you push the bearing back, the taper back here, and it tends to just get wedged down there just slightly. But you want it to fit, snug, but it should not move. This thing will be hot tanked. This box has to be machined back 580,000. It has to be tapped and drilled to 5818. I'll drill this hole out and this hole out um, slightly larger to accept the bigger bolts, and then this will be ready to go back together. Okay. Does this great conversion work? I've got to cut back this boss on the spindles to accept the disc brake caliper mounting plate. This one's already been cut back. The dimensions 580 thousandths, which is just a little more than a half an inch. Then it has to be tapped to 5818. This one's done. I'm just starting on this one. I took one cut over here. And what you have to do basically is just raise the table. I'm taking 50 thousandths off at a time because you can't take too much. You get this cutter too hot and it'll go dull. And then you have some cutting oil in there. This is a vert vertical Bridgeport mill, and I'm just going to machine that off. I've got a jig here to hold this thing really rigid. I checked it with the bubble level here to make sure that I had it level in both directions this way and this way. And now I'm going to go ahead and take that material off. So I'm ready to take my second cut. 
I'm going to do that right now. I'm keeping track. I thought I'd forgetting where I'm at and taking off too much or taking off too little. So I've taken the first $50 cut. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my second $50. Put so the set up. Put a little cutting oil on there. Start the machine. And I'll feed it by hand across. I'll keep oiling it every so often. Take it slowly across. Make a little bit of vibration, but it seems to be rigid enough to hold it in place. Kind of take it slow. Just to give you a on it. Go ahead and install it back on the car. You'll notice that two of the little hole, the two of the holes of the steering arm go have been drilled out for a larger depth there, and also right over there. In order to accommodate the larger bolts on this type of brake system. For the drum brakes, they'll have to be removed, as you can see them hanging there. We've got new ones that will have to be installed. To match the drilled out holes for the steering arms on the spindles, we've drilled out the steering arms. The steering arms here, you can see the two holes are drilled out larger than half inch. And that was done up in the metal shop in the overhead drill press. We've got the power brake booster installed in the, against the firewall, which is pretty difficult to get it up in there and bolted into the um, on the inside of the car, although this is a factory um, power brake booster, so it fits pretty well once it's in there. This master cylinder is not factory. You can see right down on the on the master cylinder is hitting the fender there, and that will have to be moved out um, and dented in to make that master cylinder fit right. Then what's next, next of course, is to get all the brake lines arranged, which we'll be showing how to do next. See, they've got the Power brake booster and the master cylinder installed. We had to bend my own lines here and down like that to go down to this proportioning valve. This one's adjustable. So we had to bend another line here to go down. This one goes to the front brakes. The back one to the proportioning valve goes to the back brakes. I've also routed a line that goes around the front of the engine. See now that the spindle that's been machined is now installed. The caliper dust shield is installed. The caliper mounting brackets installed. These two bolts were torqued to 70 pounds, like the book said. This one to 140, like the book said. The springs back in. The shocks in. Both control arms are in. You'll also notice that the new brake hose is on. The only thing that's left out here is to go ahead and pack the front wheel bearings and put the disc on, or the rotor, and then to put the caliper on connect the hose, and then we'll have to bleed the brakes, and we're about done with the brakes. you also notice while we're under here that I put new tie rod ends, outer and inner on. I also put these really trick um, tie rod adjusting sleeves that are tubular. They're a lot more rigid than the factory ones, so they give a little more steering rigidity um, and so on. If we walk around here, you can look at the sway bar. I, this car came with a factory 5 8 inch sway bar. I've installed a one inch, which is a lot thicker with these urethane bushings here and in here on the strut rod. Come around and take a look. Those red ones on the strut rod. And that'll keep the car, when you go around a corner, it'll keep it from swaying out of the corner. One other thing that I did here as well was on the lower control arms, 
I welded up here and up in there. And I welded the steel on here to add rigidity to both lower control arms. So the front end's going to be a lot more stable. So from here, you know, assemble to put the rotors on with the new front wheel bearings, calipers on, bleed the brakes, and then we'll have to align the front end and we're about done.